the state funeral. It's probably the highest tribute we have to honor our countrymen. This is the funeral of John George Diefenbaker. As the country looked on on national television, the former Prime Minister left Parliament Hill for the last time. This was the last chance we had to pay tribute to John Diefenbaker. The last chance to surround him with ceremony and with respect. The drums were muffled. The march was slow. The loss was great. And for John George Diefenbaker, all the pageantry and discipline of the state funeral were on parade. And as we honor the passing of a prime minister, so we also honor the passing of our comrades in arms. There are three different types of funerals, the civilian, the state, and the military. Here we are going through the stages and learning the ceremonies surrounding the military funeral. This unit has been charged with the responsibility of mounting a military funeral. The regimental sergeant major has selected the people he needs and the training is underway. The funeral party itself differs according to the rank of the deceased. The chief of defense staff, for example, would command an escort of 400, a guard of 50, and eight chief warrant officers as pallbearers. For the rank of sergeant and below, the funeral escort would be 20, the guard 12, and if possible, the eight pallbearers would be the same rank as the deceased. Honorary pallbearers are not required for the funerals of sergeants and lesser ranks. The funeral parade is a complicated one and relies on careful planning and execution. We are paying our final respects here to comrades, to fellow soldiers, and it's important that everyone is aware of his part. Careful preparation includes researching all the locations, from the church, to the grave. It is important too that the family, the next of kin, be consulted and advised. Their wishes are primary. At this rehearsal, the commander, while making sure the correct procedure for carrying the coffin is followed, must also remember that the words of command during the funeral parade should be restrained. It's a fine line he has to draw here because the commands have to be given loudly enough to be heard and understood, yet not too loudly as to interfere with the ceremony. Like most parades, there are many small details, and it is attention to these details which eventually make a successful and meaningful occasion. It's here on parade grounds like this one that the details have to be worked on and worked on.
It is important that before arriving at the funeral parlor, the funeral commander have in his possession the necessary elastics, pins, and tape he will need to secure the flag, the headdress, the medals, and the bayonet. The casket becomes the responsibility of the funeral commander as soon as the coffin is closed. It is up to him to make sure the casket is properly prepared. The next of kin will decide whether the casket is draped in the Canadian flag or the armed forces flag. The flag is a symbol that the deceased has died or was prepared to die in the service of his country. On the caskets of officers and chief warrant officers, the sword is placed. On the caskets of master warrant officers and lesser ranks, a bayonet. If the church service is to take place within approximately half a kilometer from the funeral parlor, the parade will line up as shown here. Number one, escort. Number two, guard. Number three, band. Number four, clergy. Number five, gun carriage or hearse. Number six, bearer party and commander. Number seven, headdress bearers. Number eight, honorary pallbearers. Number nine, commander gun carriage. Number 10, insignia bearer. If the church is beyond the half kilometer, then transportation should be provided and the funeral party should be in position before the arrival of the casket. Notice here that as the escort makes their way to the front of the church, the guard prepares to position itself in the previously chosen place facing the church, but allowing ample space for the gun carriage to arrive. The honorary pallbearers march next to the casket. The pallbearers are on the outside. As the guard dresses and the casket arrives, the honorary pallbearers will take up their position at the entrance of the church, and the actual pallbearers will take up their position to remove the casket. Notice that the headdress bearer will take the headdress in order. When the time comes to return them, he will hand them back in reverse order. The last hat he takes will be the first one he returns. As the casket is removed from the gun carriage, the funeral commander will order present arms and the honorary pallbearers will come to salute. Carried at the shoulder, feet first, the casket is taken into the church. The pallbearer's headdress are always removed when carrying the casket. The pallbearers must remember that stepping off is done with the inside foot. This helps maintain stability. The funeral commander will have inspected the church beforehand and planned the entrance of the casket. The casket always sits feet closest to the altar except in the case of clergymen where the positioning is reversed. A seating plan such as this is recommended, but it should be done in consultation with the next of kin. Following the service, the casket should leave the church behind the clergyman and the honorary pallbearers. The next of kin should follow the insignia bearers, and they should be followed by relatives and other mourners. If the gravesite is less than half a kilometer from the church, then the guard and escort should prepare to march to the location. If the gravesite is more than half a kilometer, then transportation should be provided, and again the guard and escort should be in position before the casket arrives. In this case, the graveyard is in the church grounds. The guard has been formed up in the original position, and the gun carriage has been repositioned outside the church in the direction of the gravesite. This has been completed 
during the service. The honorary pallbearers, who had formed two lines at the church door, await the command to shoulder arms. Upon this command, they come from salute to attention, and then rejoin the bearer party, taking up their position next to the gun carriage. The procession to the graveyard is in the same order as the procession to the church. If there is a band, the band will be positioned before the officiating clergy. It will be followed by the gun carriage, the bearer party, honorary pallbearers, the commander of the gun carriage, the insignia bearer, chief mourners, military mourners in uniform, and mourners not in uniform. If it is to be taken by hearse, the casket must be lowered to the waist before being placed in the hearse. But basically the same procedure is followed. This is a suggested positioning plan for a gravesite. It must, of course, take in the available geography and the wishes of the next of kin. At the graveyard, the guard and the escort are already in position, and arms are presented as the casket is removed from the gun carriage. The honorary pallbearers and the commander of the escort salute. The pallbearers bring the casket to the grave head first and lower it onto the stretchers over the grave. They will then take up a previously chosen position, and as the guard shoulders arms, the pallbearers are given back their headdress. As the officiating chaplain steps forward to the foot of the casket, the parade commander orders, parade remove headdress. The guard commander orders, rest on your arms, reversed, and the officiating chaplain completes the service. The traditional volley of three blank rounds will be fired only if the next of kin requests it. The volley should be fired upon the completion of the burial service. If there is no volley requested, the parade commander will order the replacement of headdress and the guard will present arms as the bugler sounds the last post. Following a 10 second pause, he sounds reveille. All officers and all service personnel not under command 
shall salute until Reveille is completed. Once Reveille has been completed, the guard shoulders arms and respects are paid at the graveside by the chief mourners and military personnel in order of rank. Once the mourners have gone, the commander of the bearer party collects the flag, medals, sword, and headdress. The flag is folded on the coffin by the bearer party. It is folded first in two, then four, then at a point, until it is finally tucked into itself. The flag may also be folded when stretched between the bearer party. The result should be the same. The flag, headdress, and medals are delivered to the unit commander or his representative, who will choose a suitable occasion to make the official presentation to the next of kin. In the case of cremation, a similar service is held either at the church or at the crematorium, again in consultation with the next of kin. <laughs> 